Hello and welcome to Career Right. I am Nishant and once again I am here with a new topic. And my today's topic is object oriented programming with C++ interview questions and answers. So without wasting time, let's get started now. All right, so let's start with the first one. Why do we need object oriented programming? Object oriented programming was developed because of the limitations discovered in earlier approaches to programming. Before OOP, there were procedural languages which include C, Pascal, Fortran, etc. In a procedural program, program code is written in top-down approach and the program is divided into functions or procedures. There are also two kinds of data, which are local data and global data. A local data is defined in a function and is accessible only by that function and global data is accessible by any function in a program. And this is very simple style of programming and is very efficient for small programs. However, there are two major limitations with procedural languages. First is unrestricted access. As a program grows larger, there are many functions and global data items which leads to a larger number of connections between them, which is not a good practice in programming. For example, it could make a program difficult to be modified. Suppose when a global data items type is changed from integer to float, all the functions that access that particular global data item must be modified to work with a float data item. And it is not an easy job when there are many functions in the program. Second is procedural programming provides a poor model of real world. Now coming to the next one. What is object oriented programming? Object oriented programming is a style of programming where the data items and the functions that operate on those data items are grouped into a unit known as an object. In C++ the data items are called as data members and the functions are called as member functions. In object oriented programming a program typically consists of a number of objects which communicate with each other by calling each other's member functions. Programming languages that support object-oriented paradigm are C++, Java, C Sharp, Python, PHP, and many more. Let's take another question. What are the characteristics of object-oriented programming? The characteristics of object-oriented programming are class, objects, inheritance, polymorphism, abstraction, and encapsulation. Now coming to the next one, what are classes and objects? In an object-oriented programming, a class is considered as a plan or a blueprint of an object. A class specifies what data and functions will be included in that object. A class must always be defined before the creation of an object. And by defining the class, does not automatically create the object. An object is an instance of a class in the same way a rose is an instance of a flower. An object embodies the exact characteristics of the class. And when an object is created, a space is reserved for it in the memory. Since an object contains data and functions, there is a close match between object in OOPS and object in real life. And this close similarity revolutionized the design of programs. For example, let's take a car. It has a property such as model, color, brand, year, etc. And it also has different functions such as to start a car, drive the car, stop the car, etc. This can be represented in a program with the help of objects. Now let's take an example. We have created a class called car. We have given access specifier as public. We have also declared data members and member functions. And then we have defined member functions in a class. Now in the main function, we have created an object name as car1 of the car. We have assigned value to data members. And then we called a member functions. Now let's take another question. What is inheritance? Inheritance is one of the core concepts of OOPS. 
Inheritance is a mechanism where one class acquires the attributes and member functions of another class. The class which is inherited from is known as base class, whereas the class that inherits from the base class is known as derived class. Derived classes can inherit the characteristics of the base class and can also add new ones of their own. Now, in, a, in order to inherit from another class, we can use colon symbol. Now, we have an example over here where the vehicle is a base class and the class car is inherited from the base class vehicle is a derived class. Now coming to the next question, what is polymorphism? In simple terms, polymorphism means more than one form, which means that an entity behaves differently in different situations. For example, a man possesses different behavior in different situations. He can act at the same time like a father, a husband, or an employee. In C++, we can implement polymorphism in three ways, such as function overloading, operator overloading, and function overriding. Now let's try to understand each of them. And the first one is function overloading. In C++, you can have two or more functions with same name, but each function with different parameters. And depending on the number of arguments or type of arguments that is supplied when calling a function, the function with matching parameters is called. Function overloading is a type of compile time polymorphism. Now coming to the next one, operator overloading. In C++, we can change the behavior of an operator in a program. We can overload an operator only when we are operating on user-defined types such as objects and structures. We cannot use operator overloading on basic types such as in double float, etc. Basically, operator overloading is same as function overloading, where different operator function has the same symbol but different operands and depending on operand, different operator functions are executed. Operator overloading is also an example of compile time polymorphism. Now let's understand function overriding. Function overriding is like creating a new version of an old function in a child class. In C++ inheritance, you can have a function with the same name in both the base class and the derived class. However, when we call that function using the object of the derived class, the function in the derived class is executed instead of the one in the base class. And this is known as function overriding. Function overriding is a runtime polymorphism. Now let us understand what is the difference between compile time polymorphism and runtime polymorphism. In compile time polymorphism, the C++ compiler will select the required member function at compile time. Whereas runtime polymorphism, the required member function to call is established at runtime. Compile time polymorphism is also known as static binding. Runtime polymorphism is also known as dynamic binding. Compile time polymorphism can be achieved by function overloading and operator overloading. Whereas runtime polymorphism can be achieved by virtual functions and function overriding. Compile time polymorphism is faster in execution since it already knows which function to call. Whereas runtime polymorphism is slower in execution as compared to compile time polymorphism. Coming to the next question, what is abstraction in OOPS? In object-oriented programming, data abstraction or abstraction means displaying only essential information and hiding away the background details. Data abstractions provide an interface to the user while hiding away the implementation details of the program. One example of data abstraction in C++ is the use of header files. For example, log function 
that returns the natural logarithm of a number is present in the header file called cmath. In the program, we don't have to know the algorithm of calculating the logarithm of a number. We simply call the log function with an argument and the logarithm of that argument is returned. And thus the details of implementation are hidden. Now let us understand what is encapsulation. Encapsulation is one of the key features of object-oriented programming. It is a process of grouping similar code in one place. That is related data members and functions are grouped together in a single class. Encapsulation makes our code cleaner, easy to read and provide better controls for the modification of our data items. For example, to calculate area of a rectangle, we need three things. Length of the rectangle, breadth of a rectangle, and a function to calculate the area of a rectangle. And all these related members are then grouped together into a single class where you can conceptualize better and read easily. Now let us understand what is data heading in C++. Data heading means the data are concealed within a class so that it prevents accidental accessing by functions outside the class. The primary mechanism for hiding data is to put the data in the class and declare them as private. Private data and functions can only be accessed from within the same class. Data hiding is designed to protect programmers from honest mistakes. Coming to the next question, what is the difference between C and C++? C follows a procedural programming paradigm whereas C++ follows an object-oriented paradigm. C is a subset of C++, whereas C++ is a superset of C. In C, data and functions are separated, whereas in C++, data and functions are encapsulated together. There are no access specifier in C whereas there are access specifiers in C++. Namespace is not available in C. Namespace is available in C++. Scanf and printf are used for input-output in C, whereas C in and C out are used for input-output in C++. Data heading is not supported in C, whereas data heading is supported in C++. Now let us understand what are the access specifiers in C++. Access specifiers decide how the members of a class can be accessed by different members outside the class. In C++ there are three types of access specifiers that is public, private and protected. Now let us understand each of them. Public, the members which are declared as public can be accessed from outside the class. Private. Here the members declared as private can only be accessed by members member functions in the same class. Protected. Here the members declared as protected cannot be accessed from outside the class. However, they can be accessed in inherited classes. Now let us understand what are structures in C++. A structure is a collection of variables of different data types. A structure is a specification for a new data type which is user defined. A structure is defined using struct keyword. Now let's have an example of a structure here. In this example, the structure definition serves only as the blueprint for the creation of the variables of type citizen and does not actually create the variables. It does not reserve space for them in the memory. In order to actually create the variable, you will have to create a variable citizen1 of type citizen in the main function. Now let us understand what is the difference between structures and classes. Structures are very similar to classes since a structure can also contain functions inside it. Therefore, a structure group together both data and functions just like a class. But only difference between them is that the class items inside a structure are public by default 
whereas the data items inside a class are private by default. However, in most situations, programmers use structure to group only data and classes to group both data and functions. All right, so let's understand what are constructors in C++. A constructor is a specialized member function that is called automatically whenever an object is created. A constructor is primarily used to initialize data members of an object. Now let us understand rules for defining a constructor. First, a constructor must have the same name as the class of which they are members. This is the one way to let the compilers know that it is a constructor. And second, a constructor must not have any return type. Alright, so let's have an example of a constructor. So in this example, you can see a constructor called shoes has the same name as the class and it doesn't have any return type. Moving on to the next one, what are the types of constructor in C++? And we have three types of constructors in C++ and the first one is default constructor. A constructor with no parameters is known as a default constructor. And let's have an example of default constructor here. The second one is parameterized constructor. A constructor that has parameters are known as parameterized constructor. So let's have an example of parameterized constructor. And the third one is copy constructor. It is a special constructor that creates a new object as a copy of existing object. So let's have an example of copy constructor here. Now let's understand what are destructors. Destructors is a special member function that is invoked automatically when an object is destroyed. Destructors must have the same name as its class and doesn't have an arguments and return type and is preceded by a tilt sign. And the most common use of destructors is to deallocate memory that are allocated for the object. So let's have an example here. Now let us understand what is a namespace in C++. Namespace is a declarative reason that provides scope to identifiers inside it. It is a method to prevent name conflicts of variables functions in a program. In a big project, there can be big chance that there may be two or more variables or functions with the same name and this will result in error when compiled. To resolve this issue, the namespace is introduced in C++. Now let's have an example of a namespace. So in this example, through the use of namespace, we can use the same variable name x and function name printx in the same program. Now coming to the last question, what are inline functions? In C++ while compiling a program, if a function is declared as inline, the actual code of the function is inserted into the location of the inline function instead of jumping to the function which is done in normal member functions. Inline function speeds up the execution process of the function. To define an inline function, you need to specify the keyword inline as before the function definition. 